A water hole in Africa is like Piccadilly Circus in London or Times Square in New York. Sooner or later, everyone from miles around shows up there. Some come to eat. Most come to drink. A few come to hunt. This is the story of the visitors, the residents, and the dramas that affect their lives at a typical waterhole in Etosha National Park, Namibia. It's just after the rains. This waterhole in Etosha is different from those in many parts of Africa. It's spring-fed, and unlike most other waterholes, never dries up. You'd expect that animals would come thronging to it once the rains have topped it up. But not a bit of it. It's deserted, except for the resident birds, like the dab chick and red-billed teal. After a few weeks of hot sun, the rainwater puddles out in the bush all dry up. Then the animals start to trickle back. A few at first, and then in gradually increasing herds. The year-round story of this Etosha waterhole starts just after the rains. The return of the herds is bad news for two of the resident birds. A pair of blacksmith plovers has decided to nest right at the water's edge. Plovers are courageous birds. They stand their ground against all comers, spreading their wings and cursing in defense of their nest. The surviving yellow flowers will eventually all get eaten. The big animals aren't particularly fond of them. They're a weed that flourishes where all the grass has been eaten around the waterhole. The springbok try to avoid them, not always successfully. Now, the plovers have eggs to protect from all those trampling hooves. Three large warthogs arrive to drink and wallow and add to the plover's problems. At the waterhole, there's always some new happening. The rains have triggered off the hatching of millions of small brown flies providing a feast for water birds, especially the waders.
the green shank has to pick off each fly separately and delicately. The fulvous tree duck and the cape teal just scoop them up wholesale with their bills. The plague of flies has come at just the right time for the red-billed teal and her hungry brood of ducklings. There always seems to be one in every brood who ignores the convoy system without appreciating the danger it runs. The threat this time comes from a lana falcon. Missed both times. The little teal survives by diving and rejoins the brood. The lana's next attack is on the whole convoy. This time, the teal get away with it. The blacksmith plovers are still having serious problems. There's only one possible treatment for nosy zebra. In the end, it isn't the zebra's hooves that prove the plover's undoing. Tawny eagles will even eat carrion, and eggs are always welcome. The eagle broke all three eggs, but didn't eat one of them. It was probably hoping to find a fully formed chick inside. The plovers' spirited diving attacks are all in vain. Now the plover will probably lay again in a safer place. The parents recover the cracked eggs and carry them about 30 yards away. They pull the embryos out of the shells and then give the whole situation up as hopeless. The springbok have their young in the time of good grazing after the first rains. The young are just the sort of easy meat a lion is always looking for.
There is one young animal lions usually leave severely alone. Just the same, elephants would be much happier if the lions weren't around when they bring their young to drink. And they tell them so in no uncertain manner. During and just after the rains, the elephants of Itosha do the biggest disappearing trick of all. They simply vanish into the woodland to the northeast. They do so largely to avoid the soft soil in which the waterhole lies, where they could easily get bogged down. A month after the rains have stopped, the country dries up fast, and suddenly they're back in great strength. There's nothing an elephant loves so much as water. And after the bath, a dust down. The white Etosha soil is the elephant equivalent of talcum powder. Because of the colour of the soil, pink elephants are quite common in Etosha. These yellow flowers grow on a low, scrubby species of acacia that is spreading and crowding out more valuable trees. The giraffe have no complaints about that. Where acacia nebrownii grows close to the waterhole, they've got everything they need, at least for a day or so.
Watch how the tongue manipulates the thorns to strip the flowers. When a giraffe takes a drink, it looks as though it must suffer a sudden rush of blood to the head. So it would do, but for a network of spongy tissues and valves between neck and brain that absorb the blood and slow up the downward flow. In Etosha, the combined attractions of acacias and a drink sometimes draw herds of 30 or 40 giraffe to the waterhole. But such a gathering rarely results in outbreaks of high spirits like this. As with a herd of horses, it all seems to be triggered off by one skittish animal. Those long muscular legs, so lazily graceful in play, can kill a lion with a single kick. Even though giraffes at a water hole look easy prey, lions usually leave the adults alone. But this giraffe is an exception and has a bad shoulder wound from a previous lion attack. Perhaps the wound is why this lion made another half-hearted attempt. Somehow, both parties seem to recognize that it's not going to come to anything. The lions lie down and the giraffe, slowly and without any sign of alarm, approaches the water once more. Dusk is not very far away and the giraffe wisely decides that the half-light might be a bad time to push its luck any further. Sunset is the time when the prey animals leave the water hole and seek the comparative safety of the open plains. As the moon comes up, only those big enough to have nothing to fear from others or from their own kind are left. What happens at the waterhole under the moon is usually a closed book. New camera techniques with an image intensifier have made it possible to see what only the bland, cold eye of the moon looks down upon.
Etosha is one of the black rhinos, very last strongholds. Though you wouldn't guess this if you relied simply on daylight for your observations. At night, they come to drink and indulge in the heavyweight punch-ups so dear to a rhino's armor-protected heart. The elephant herd just ignores the rhino goings-on and takes pride of place at the water. Some double-banded sand grouse have taken advantage of the full moon to do some night flying and drinking. A rhino with a large calf has a dispute with another cow. When a smaller herd of elephants arrives, it finds itself in the middle of a pride of lions, and they just can't be ignored. The lions back down, even though they're in superior numbers and have two big males with them. Probably it's sheer devilment on the part of the elephants, though they do have calves with them and may be worried. But no real drama will develop at the waterhole from this confrontation. The true dramas will start again when the sun comes up. black-headed heron waits for victims. Zebra pluck up courage to come in from the plains. The black-headed heron is an extremely unpopular regular at the waterhole. The blacksmith plovers give it a routine low-level attack. It isn't the plovers that it preys on. The heron's speciality is doves. Missed. The heron spends all day at the waterhole stalking Cape turtle doves. Having caught them, it dunks them in the water to damp their feathers before swallowing. The heron has its own problems. The resident tawny eagle steals a percentage of its prey. There are plenty more where that one came from, and the heron never gives up. Its talent is rare among herons, if not unique. It appears to have worked out the stalking technique all on its own.
Namaqua doves, a smaller species that it's very successful with. Got one. This time it's taking no chances and flies off with its prey, pursued by the eagle. The doves who come to drink at the water hole face submarine attack as well. This one has a lucky escape. But the capture of the next victim has an almost prehistoric horror about it. Though bedraggled, the dove finally escapes. The terrapins, finding themselves too far from the water to feel safe, scuttle back to try again. Like most cats, Lions are naturally curious. They're also nervous of unfamiliar situations. A very unfamiliar situation is about to develop. If you hadn't seen the terrapins trap the doves by the leg, you wouldn't have a clue what has happened to this egret. Note the black-headed heron hoping to gain from the egret's plight. An approaching lioness is too much even for the heron. At least one terrapin has got a firm grip on the egret's foot. The lions appear never to have seen anything like this in their entire lives.
By the time a cub goes to investigate, the egret is free. Free, but decidedly lame. Very few predators can get the better of a terrapin, but just occasionally it does happen. The fish eagle's curved talons and hooked beak can find the chinks in the terrapin's armour. Perhaps this was why the terrapins who attacked the dove were so anxious not to stray too far from the water. The armour of the tortoise just has to be foolproof. Though it can swim, it lives practically all its life on land. There it's exposed to all manner of dangers, from lions who would like to eat it, to elephants who might accidentally step on it. If the water hole provides moments of comedy, its scenario also includes scenes of extreme beauty. The blue cranes are coming to drink among a small party of kudu. The sight of a lion nearby, hidden in the yellow grass, alarms these two cranes into calling and dancing. As the dry season progresses, at least 200 bird species come to the waterhole. The great white pelican to fish. But most, like the ostriches, to drink and perhaps quarrel, like these three females over a solitary male. A battler eagle with two young. The Cory Bustard is made unwelcome by a crow.
The mixed drinkers include bulbuls, glossy starlings, red-headed finches and weavers. A waxbill, grey lares, and a Myers parrot. The same beach is also open for mixed bathing. Hosts of small birds, as well as giants like the four foot high Cory Bustard. or the crowned guinea fowl, who often arrive in huge coveys. Locust swarms of red-billed quedia, whose combined weight sometimes breaks the branches from the trees. August is the height of the dry season. The rains won't start until October. Now the animals are completely dependent on Etosha's waterholes for their survival. The mercy is that these are spring-fed and almost never dry up. A large family of banded mongooses comes to drink. The parents are cautious. They've got a lot of young with them. Those are Namaqua sand grouse. Despite his size, the wallowing warthog doesn't worry the mongooses. But the jackal makes everyone slightly apprehensive. These guinea fowl have been waiting to get to the water for some time. They've been scared of crossing a large open space. The coveys have gradually built up until there are hundreds of birds waiting to cross. Finally, when numbers give them courage, it's as if a dam has broken, releasing a flood of birds. Some get their drink. But then the jackal spooks them, just as it spooked the mongooses. A far stealthier and deadlier hunter lurks beneath the surface of the waterhole. The python snorkels its nostrils cunningly hidden among the waterweed.
The Egyptian goose spots the danger. For the red-billed teal, it's already too late. Caught in the python's coils, the duck is quickly squeezed to death. While the rest of its 10-foot body puts on the lethal pressure, the python comes up for air. A snake like this can stay totally submerged for at least an hour. The final act of the drama. The python swallows the duck, still gripped in its coils. Flamingos aren't usually found feeding on waterholes, they're too small. But when the 70 mile long Etosha pan dries up, then they have nowhere else to go without making a long journey. They're normally only found on large soda lakes or at the coast, so flamingos are rarely seen in company with drinking zebra, kudu and wildebeest. Even rarer is to find them, in such a cramped and unlikely setting, forming up into display parties. This strutting march is a prelude to courtship. They've got to go through the routine somewhere, and the waterhole is the only permanent water around. They're mostly lesser flamingos, but with some graters among them. Avocets sweep their bills in the foreground, probably looking for the same sort of crustacea that the flamingos are having to feed on under drought conditions. One reason why flamingos choose large, remote lakes on which to feed and breed is that they feel safe there from land predators. There's no guarantee of such safety here. When the rains come, the Atosha Pan will flood and the flamingos will return there. If the rains are late, they may have to move hundreds of miles perhaps to the salt pans along the coast. The height of the dry season is an easy time for hunters. Antelope, like these kudu, have to concentrate at the waterhole. Adult kudu are usually safe from cheetah. They're too big. 
she's after smaller game, Springbok. This time, she loses her quarry and the dust kicked up in the chase. She's got a large family to feed, so she'll stick around the waterhole until she does kill. She disregards the adult springbok to her left and picks a younger victim. She drags back the kill and calls to the cubs left close to the waterhole. She lets her family feed before she eats herself. Finally, she cleans them up. Later, she'll lead them down for a drink. For the cheetah family too, the waterhole has provided all the necessities of life. But very soon now, the waterhole will cease to mean anything in the lives of all these animals. It's October and the rains are coming. The springboks see the storms and start to move away from the permanent water. There's both food and drink out there where the rain is falling. The rhino won't need this spring-fed puddle much longer. The springbok prompt joyfully, leaping high as if at release from the confinement the waterhole has imposed on them. As to the waterfowl, they'll move around a bit, but the permanent residents, the teal, the Egyptian geese, will stay on throughout the rains that will continue to deluge down from October to March. And at the end of the downpour, the grass will be green again. The waterhole will still be there. It'll be a little fuller and a lot fresher, but there won't be an animal in sight. There'll be carpets of yellow flowers, but nothing to eat them. It's hard to imagine that all those dramas ever took place here. But give it a few weeks, and let the sun do its work, and they'll all be back. For all the waterhole's dangers, the animals of Itosha would perish if they stayed away from it too long.
The springbok have their young in the time of good grazing after the first rains. The young are just the sort of easy meat a lion is always looking for. There is one young animal lions usually leave severely alone. Just the same, elephants would be much happier if the lions weren't around when they bring their young to drink. And they tell them so in no uncertain manner. Three large warthogs arrive to drink and wallow and add to the plover's problems. At the waterhole, there's always some new happening. The rains have triggered off the hatching of millions of small brown flies providing a feast for water birds, especially the waders. The green shank has to pick off each fly separately and delicately. The fulvous tree duck and the cape teal just scoop them up wholesale with their bills. The plague of flies has come at just the right time for the red-billed teal and her hungry brood of ducklings. There always seems to be one in every brood who ignores the convoy system without appreciating the danger it runs. The threat this time comes from a lana falcon. missed both times. The little teal survives by diving and rejoins the brood. The lanner's next attack is on the whole convoy. Mulls would come thronging to it once the rains have topped it up but not a bit of it. It's deserted, except for the resident birds like the dab chick and red-billed teal. After a few weeks of hot sun, the rainwater puddles out in the bush all dry up. Then the animals start to trickle back, a few at first, and then in gradually increasing herds. The year-round story of this Itosha waterhole starts just after the rains. The return of the herds is bad news for two of the resident birds. 
A pair of blacksmith plovers has decided to nest right at the water's edge. Plovers are courageous birds. They stand their ground against all comers, spreading their wings and cursing in defense of their nest. The surviving yellow flowers will eventually all get eaten. The big animals aren't particularly fond of them. They're a weed that flourishes where all the grass has been eaten around the waterhole. The springbok try to avoid them, not always successfully. Now, the plovers have eggs to protect from all those trampling hooves. A waterhole in Africa is like Piccadilly Circus in London or Times Square in New York. Sooner or later, everyone from miles around shows up there. Some come to eat. Most come to drink. A few come to hunt. This is the story of the visitors, the residents, and the dramas that affect their lives at a typical waterhole in Etosha National Park, Namibia. It's just after the rains. This waterhole in Etosha is different from those in many parts of Africa. It's spring-fed, and unlike most other waterholes, never dries up. You'd expect that animals... This time, the teal get away with it. The blacksmith plovers are still having serious problems. There's only one possible treatment for nosy zebra.
In the end, it isn't the zebra's hooves that prove the plover's undoing. Tawny eagles will even eat carrion, and eggs are always welcome. The eagle broke all three eggs, but didn't eat one of them. It was probably hoping to find a fully formed chick inside. The plover's spirited diving attacks are all in vain. Now the plover will probably lay again in a safer place. The parents recover the cracked eggs and carry them about 30 yards away. They pull the embryos out of the shells and then give the whole situation up as hopeless.